Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to our reading of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. We are, uh, we are up to chapter 56, which takes place in the immediate aftermath of the happy conclusion of the action that started this book. This book starts with Netherfield Hall being let at last. It is let by a wealthy young man named Mr. Bingley, who is handsome and outgoing and friendly and who falls in love with Jane Bennett, the eldest daughter of the Bennett family much to the relief of Mrs. Bennet, who wants all five of her daughters married before she dies. Uh, especially since, as we've seen, Longbourn, the Longbourn estate, with its paddock and its farm and its copses and its shrubbery, uh, goes lock, stock, and barrel to, the, to Mr. Collins, who is named in the entail. So Mrs. Bennet and the, the girls don't get to stay there after Mr. Bennet died. Long, long prolonged may that day be. Uh, that whole plot arc is now resolved. Bingley has proposed to Jane and been accepted by her and the family. Uh, and that brings us to chapter 56, which is probably my favorite single chapter in the book. It's certainly my favorite latter chapter. Uh, and we'll get, we'll get right on it. I have a number of things to provoke you about with this chapter. One morning, about a week after Bingley's engagement with Jane had been formed, as he and the females of the family were sitting together in the dining room, their attention was suddenly drawn to the window by the sound of a carriage, and they perceived a chaise and four driving up the lawn. It was too early in the morning for visitors, and besides, the, equi the equipage did not answer to that of any of their neighbors. The horses were post, and neither the carriage nor the livery of the servant who preceded it were familiar to them. As it was certain, however, that somebody was coming, Bingley instantly prevailed on Miss Bennet, that's Jane Bennet, uh, to avoid the confinement of such an intrusion and walk away with him into the shrubbery. They both set off, and the conjectures of the remaining three continued, though with little satisfaction, till the door was thrown open and their visitor entered. It was Lady Catherine de Bourgh. They were, of course, all intending to be surprised, but their astonishment was beyond their expectation. And on the part of Mrs. Bennet and Kitty, though she was perfectly unknown to them, even inferior to what Elizabeth felt. She entered the room with an air of more than usual, uh, more than, than um, an air more than usually ungracious, made no other reply to Elizabeth's salutations than a slight inclination of the head, and sat down without saying a word. Elizabeth had mentioned her name to her mother, and on her ladyship's entrance, though no request of introduction had been made. Mrs. Bennet, all amazement, though flattered by having a guest of such high importance, received her with the utmost politeness. After sitting for a moment in silence, they said very, she said very stiffly to Elizabeth, I hope you are well, Miss Bennet. That lady, I suppose, is your mother? I don't think you're going to be able, if you're not familiar with the time period, I don't think you're going to be able to perceive just how insulting Lady Catherine de Bourgh is being here. She wasn't invited. She isn't asking or standing in the way of introduction. She walks into the room and sits down. Silence results, because no one knows what to do. That's how rude she's being. And then she has to browbeat the identities of the other people in the room out of the one person in the room she does know. Uh, Elizabeth replied very concisely that she was. And that, I suppose, is one of your sisters? Yes, madam, said Mrs. Bennet, delighted to speak to Lady Catherine. She is my youngest girl but one. My youngest, of all, is lately married, and my eldest is somewhere about the grounds, walking with a young man who I believe will soon become part of the family. You have a very small park here, returned Lady Catherine, after a short silence. It is nothing compared in comparison to Rosings, my lady, I dare say, but I assure you it is much larger than Sir William Lucas's. <laughs> uh, this must be a most inconvenient sitting room for the evening. In summer, the windows are full west. Mrs. Bennet assured her that they never sat there after dinner, and then added, May I take the liberty of asking your ladyship whether you left Mr. and Mrs. Collins well? Yes, very well. I saw them the night before last. Elizabeth now expected that she would produce a letter for her from Charlotte, as it seemed the only probable motive for her calling. But no letter appeared, and she was completely puzzled. Well... Lady Catherine has another motive for visiting. <laughs> Mrs. Bennet, with great civility, begged her ladyship to take some refreshment, but Lady Catherine, very resolutely and not very politely, declined eating anything. Then, rising up, said to Elizabeth, Miss Bennet, 
There seemed to be a prettyish kind of little wilderness on one side of your lawn. I should be glad to take a turn in it if you will favor me with your company. Go, my dear, cried her mother, and show her ladyship about the different walks. I think she will be pleased with the hermitage. <laughs> Elizabeth obeyed, and running into her own room for her parasol, attended her noble guests downstairs. As they passed through the hall, Lady Catherine opened the doors into the dining parlor and drawing room, and pronouncing them, after a short survey to be decent-looking rooms, walked on. Again, you might not be, I think you would be aware, if somebody did this in your own home, you would know that it was rude. She's, she's looking at the rooms on her own. She's not waiting for anyone to show them to her. She's not giving any deference to the lady of the house. She's just poking her nose in and also airing her opinions on them. If somebody did that in your house, oh, just hang on there. I'm going to walk around. Is this the oldest person's bedroom? Is this the master bath? Uh, looks pretty good. You'd consider that pretty rude. That's what's meant to be uh, uh, implied here. Uh, her carriage remained at the door, and Elizabeth saw that her waiting woman was in it. They proceeded in silence along the gravel walk that led to the cops. And again, here, I want to point out, I'm saying cops, C-O-P-S-E, as in a stand of trees, rather than corpse in the South Boston pronunciation, which would be identical with cops. <laughs> Elizabeth was determined to make no effort for conversation with a woman who was so now more than usually insolent and disagreeable. That's important to notice. That's why I bring this up. Lady Catherine is being incredibly rude here. It might seem trivial, but she's being incredibly rude. And that gets Elizabeth's back up. We've seen this already. She's perfectly willing <clears throat> to smile behind her hand at the absurdities of other people. She learned that from her father. But she absolutely will not stand rudeness. It gets her up right away, and this so this interview cannot go well, since it's Lady Catherine's purpose to be rude. How could I ever think her like her nephew, she said as she looked in her face. She's saying it to herself. Once upon a time she thought they were very alike. Now she doesn't seem them as like at all. As soon as they entered the cops, Lady Catherine began in the following manner. You can be at no loss, Miss Bennet, to understand the reason for my journey hither. Your own heart, your own conscience, must tell you why I come. Elizabeth looked with unaffected astonishment. Indeed, you are mistaken, madam. I have not been at all able to account for the honor of seeing you here. Miss Bennet, replied the, the, her ladyship in an angry tone, you ought to know that I am not to be trifled with. But however insincere you may choose to be, you shall, you shall not find me so. My character has ever been celebrated for its sincerity and frankness, and in a cause of such moment as this I shall certainly not depart from it. A report of a most alarming nature reached me two days ago. I was told that not only your sister was on the point of being most advantageously married, but that you, that Miss Elizabeth Bennet, would, in all likelihood, be soon afterwards united to my nephew, my own nephew, Mr. Darcy. Though I know it must be a scandalous falsehood, uh, though I would not injure him so much as to suppose the truth of it possible, I instantly resolved on setting off for this place, that I might make my sentiments known to you. How did word get to her? We could trace it, couldn't we? It came from the Collinses. Of course it came from Mr. Collins. But how did he learn? If you believed it impossible to be true, said Elizabeth, coloring with astonishment and disdain, I wonder you took the trouble of coming so far. What could your ladyship propose by it? At once to insist on having the, such a report universally contradicted. Your coming to Longbourn to see me and my family, said Elizabeth coolly, will rather be the confirmation of it, if indeed such a report is in existence. In other words, the Streisand effect. If people are already talking about this, you making a fuss of coming to Longbourn is certainly going to make them talk about it more, not less. <laughs> if... Do you then pretend to be ignorant of it? Has it not been industriously circulated by yourselves? Do you not know that such a report is spread abroad? I never heard that it was. And can you likewise declare that there was no foundation for it? I do not pretend to possess equal frankness with your ladyship. You may ask questions, but which I will not choose to answer. This is not to be borne. Miss Bennet, I insist on being satisfied. Has he, has my nephew, made you an offer of marriage? Your ladyship has declared it to be impossible. It ought to be so. It must be so while he retains the use of his reason. But your arts and allurements may, in a moment of infatuation, have made him forget what he owes to himself and all his family. You may have drawn him in. <laughs> if I have, I shall be the last person to confess it. See? See what I mean? 
Elizabeth is now, fir- she might not be as rude as Lady Catherine is being here, but she is now firmly entrenched. She will not be talked to this way. Miss Bennet, do you know who I am? I have not been accustomed, accustomed to such language as this. I am almost the nearest relation he has in the world, and I am entitled to know all his dearest concerns. But you are not entitled to know mine. Nor will such behavior as this ever induce me to be explicit. Let me be rightly understood. This match to which you have the presumption to aspire can never take place. No, never. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Now what have you to say? Only this, that if he is so, you can have no reason to suppose he will make an offer to me. Lady Catherine hesitated for a moment and then replied, The engagement between them is of a peculiar kind. From their very infancy they have been attended for each other. It was the favorite wish of his mother as well as of hers. While in their cradles we planned their union, and now at the moment when the wishes of both sisters would be accomplished in their marriage, is their marriage to be presented, prevented by a young woman of inferior birth, of no importance in the world, of wholly unallied to the family? Do you pay no regard to the wishes of his friends, to his tacit engagement with Mr. Bird? Are you lost to every feeling of propriety and delicacy? Have you not heard me say that from his earliest hours he was destined for his cousin? Yes, I and I have heard it before. But what is that to me? If there is no other objection to my marrying your nephew, I shall certainly not be kept from it by knowing that his mother and aunt wished him to marry Mr. Bird. You both did as much as you could in planning the marriage. Its completion depended on others. If Mr. Arthur, if Mr. Mr. Darcy is neither is neither by honor nor inclination confined to his cousin, why is he not to make another choice? And if I am that choice, may I not accept him? Because your honor, decorum, prudence, nay, interest, forbid it. Yes, Miss Bennet, interest. (laughs) That is, self-interest. For do not expect to be noticed by his family or friends if you willfully act against the inclinations of all. You will be censured, slighted, despised by everyone connected with him. Your alliance will be a disgrace. Your name will never even be mentioned by any of us. These are heavy misfortunes, replied Elizabeth, but the wife of Mr. Darcy must have such extraordinary sources of happiness necessarily attached to her situation that she could, upon the whole, have no cause to repine. Obstinate, headstrong girl, I am ashamed of you. Is this your gratitude for my attentions to you last spring? Is nothing due to me on that score? Let us sit down. You you ought to understand, Miss Bennet, that I came here with the determined resolution of carrying my purpose, nor will I be dissuaded from it. If I have not been used to submit to any person's whims, I have not been used to submit to any person's whims. I have not been in the habit of brooking disappointment. That will make your ladyship's situation at present more pitiable, but it will have no effect on me. I will not be interrupted. Hear me in silence. My daughter and my nephew are formed for each other. They are descended on the maternal side from the same noble line, and on the father's side from respectable, honorable, and ancient, though untitled, families. Their fortune, on both sides, is splendid. They are destined for each other by the voice of every member of their respective houses. And what is to divide them? The upstart pretensions of a young woman without family, connections, or fortune? Is this to be endured? (laughs) But it must not, shall not be. If you were sensible to of your own good, you would not wish to quit the sphere in which you have been brought up. In marrying your nephew, I should not consider myself as quitting that sphere. That sphere. He is a gentleman. I am a gentleman's daughter. So far, we are equal. True, you are a gentleman's daughter. But who was your mother? Who are your uncles and aunts? Do you imagine me ignorant of their condition? Whatever my connections may be, said Elizabeth, if your nephew does not object to them, they can be nothing to you. Tell me, once and for all, are you engaged to him? Though Elizabeth would not, for the mere purpose of obliging Lady Catherine, have answered this question, she could not but say, after a moment's deliberation, I am not. Lady Catherine seemed pleased. And will you promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I will make no promise of the kind. Miss Bennet, I am shocked and astonished. I expected to find a more reasonable young woman. But do not deceive yourself into a belief that I will ever recede. I shall not go away till you have given me the assurance I require. And I certainly shall never give it. I am not to be intimidated by anything so wholly unreasonable. Your ladyship wants Mr. Darcy to marry your daughter. But would my giving you wished-for promise make their marriage all the more probable? 
supposing him to be attached to me, would my refusing to accept his hand make him wish to bestow it on his cousin? Allow me to say, Lady Catherine, that the, argument with, the arguments with which you have supported this extraordinary application have been as frivolous as the application was ill-judged. You have widely mistaken my character if you think I can be worked on by such persuasions as these. How far your nephew might approve of your interference in his affairs I cannot tell, but you have certainly no right to concern yourself in mine. I must beg, therefore, to be importuned no farther on the subject. Not so hasty, if you please. I have by no means done. To all the objections I have already urged, I have still another to add. I am no stranger to the particulars of your youngest sister's infamous elopement. I know it all, that the young man's marrying her was a patched-up business at the expense of your father and uncles. In other words, she doesn't know it all. She doesn't know whose expense it really was. <laughs> And is such a girl to be my nephew's sister? Is her husband, is the son of her late, his late father's steward, to be his brother? Heavens and earth! Of what are you thinking? Are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted? <laughs> you can now have nothing farther to say, she resentfully answered. You have insulted me in every possible method. I must beg to return to the house. Well, if you're not going to end the conversation after a line like, shall the shades of Pemberley be thus polluted, you're not going to end it ever. <laughs> and she rose as she spoke. Lady Catherine rose also, and they turned back. Her ladyship was highly incensed. You have no regard, then, for the honor and credit of my nephew? Unfeeling, selfish girl. Do you not consider that a connection with you must disgrace him in the eyes of everybody? Lady Catherine, I have nothing farther to say. You know my sentiments. You are then resolved to have him? I have said no such thing. I am only resolved to act in that manner which will, in my opinion, constitute my happiness without reference to you or any other person so wholly unconnected with me. It is well. You refuse, then, to oblige me. You refuse to obey the claims of duty, honor, and gratitude. You are determined to ruin him in the opinion of his, all his friends and make him the contempt of the world. Neither duty, nor honor, nor gratitude, replied Elizabeth, have any possible claim on me in the present instance. No principle of either would be violated by my marriage to Mr. Darcy, and with regard to the resentment of his family or the indignation of the world, if the former were excited by his marrying me, it would not give me one moment's concern, and the world in general would have too much sense to join in the scorn. And this is your real opinion. This is your final resolve. Very well. I shall know how to act. Do not imagine, Miss Bennet, that your ambition will ever be gratitude, gratified. I came to try you. I hope to find you reasonable, but depend on it, I will carry my point. In this manner, Lady Catherine talked on till they were at the door of the carriage, when, turning hastily round, she added, I take no leave of you, Miss Bennet. I send no compliments to your mother. You do not deserve such attention. I am most seriously displeased. <laughs> Elizabeth made no answer and without attempting to persuade her ladyship to return into the house, walked quietly into it herself. She heard the carriage drive away as she proceeded up the stairs. Her mother impatiently met her at the door of the dressing room to ask why Lady Catherine would not come in again and rest herself. She did not choose it, said her daughter. She would go. She is a very fine-looking woman, and her calling here was prodigiously civil, for she only came, I suppose, to tell us that the Collinses were well. <laughs> She is on her road somewhere, I dare say, and so passing through Meryton thought she might as well call on you. I suppose she had nothing particular to say to you, Lizzie? <laughs> Not much. Are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted? <laughs> Elizabeth was forced to give into a little falsehood here, for to acknowledge the substance of their conversation was impossible. And that that is chapter 56. We are word not only of Bingley's engagement, but of Darcy's possible engagement, reaches the ears of Lady Catherine de Bourgh. She sets out immediately to Longbourn to try Elizabeth, to make her see sense, to warn her off. And <sighs> I love this chapter. I love Lady Catherine in full fettle. Uh, but nevertheless, I want to do something here. <laughs> I want to do something here at the end of this chapter that is a bit scandalous. But you've all been putting up with me all this time, and we've been having a great time talking about this book. Emails, comments on, other, on all of the videos. I'm not always responding to the comments, but I love them. I love them so much. People are commenting with each other and on Voxer. Just, I love it. Absolutely, this has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, and you've put up with a lot of my heresies and my, my thought-provoking, uh, I hope, opinions. And I want to offer one for this infamous chapter. 
I want to defend Lady Catherine de Bourgh here. <laughs> and, and not just because if we did a, a multi-voice amateur theatrical casting of this book to do a performance of it, I, of course, would play Lady Catherine de Bourgh. <laughs> and you could cast... What other booktubers would you cast in other roles? That's what I absolutely have to hear. But... Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's not just that. I want to defend her by asking you to take a 30,000 foot step back and look at this from her point of view. Now, there's a deadly piece of kryptonite to this exercise, but we'll get to that. The main exercise is, I want you to look at it from her point of view. She is basically the matriarch of her family. She is involved, she is the, the person who calls the shots on the social side of the family. Uh, and at the time when this book was was conceived, the whole world in which it was conceived, those families did have to worry that their sons would be ensnared by temptresses, adventuresses, who wanted money, who would who would use allures to ensnare a, the wealthy son of a family to the ruin of the family. That's usually why, one of the reasons why marriages were arraigned between relatively equal social levels, so that you weren't expected of taking on uh, a parasite, an adventurous, someone who only wanted the money or the lands and would maybe leverage them or mortgage them. It's Lady Ca well, It's one of Lady Catherine's unofficial jobs to guard against that eventuality on the assumption that a headstrong young man in love might not guard against it himself. There's a way, in other words, in which in this infamous scene her behavior is justified. Uh, I just want to, I want to float that, that she's not being just the wicked witch of the West here. Uh, before we get to the kryptonite, and there, there really, there are two pieces of kryptonite here. One is that Lady Catherine ought to know Mr. Darcy's character. She ought to know his character. She ought to know that he, he would be the last person in the world to fall for an adventuress. And two, she spent a long time, over a month, with Elizabeth. She ought to know Elizabeth's character by now. It, it might go against her worldview and everything that she's been raised to think is acceptable, but she ought to consider this match a good one. Uh, <laughs> based on those two things, she ought to. She doesn't, and I am suggesting that the weight of society, that most of the people in her rung of society at the time when this book appeared, would probably have understood what she was doing. They would be all caught up by now in the romance of this novel, but they would understand what she's doing. Uh, think about other novelists, other, other fictional worlds that we encounter, where adventuresses do get hold, of, <laughs> where actual adventuresses really do get hold of unmeaning heirs to families, to their ruin. Uh... Or maybe, uh, or maybe just barely don't. Of course, the system can go wrong. Uh, but <laughs> I just wanted to offer that one little note of possible defense for Lady Catherine de Bourgh, that she may, she may have some worldly sense on her side when she comes to do this, to try Elizabeth. I, I just want to, I wanted to offer that and also to anticipate the two pieces of kryptonite that you're all going to offer, which is that she ought to know Darcy and she ought to know Elizabeth. So she ought to know that whatever this is, however unusual it is, it's not the result of, of ignorance or allurements or anything like that. Uh, but anyway, she has come and gone. A storm. And uh, from this storm, uh, Elizabeth knows exactly where Lady Catherine de Bourgh stands, yes. But she also knows one other thing, uh, which is that there's a rumor widely abroad that Mr. Darcy is going to propose to her again. Any thought, any lingering thought that she might have had that he resents her for rejecting him the first time, that is now gone. She knows not only that that isn't true, but that everybody in the neighborhood, everybody in two counties, expects that he will propose to her. That that rumor is already out there. That's pretty interesting. How much does that incline her one way or another? We'll find out. We have only a few more chapters to go. Uh, so there you go. Those are the fireworks with uh, with Lady Catherine de Bourgh. <laughs> the shades of Beverly to be thus polluted. <laughs> I gotta love the old bitty mean. I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> but anyway, I'll wrap this up and we'll resume tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.